There's only one way to get into the look, I mean, other than taking a Dremel to it, and that's by prying its face off. It's held on by both adhesive and little plastic clips around the edge, so it takes a little work with a spudger to get it to start moving. On mine, the black cover plate was offset to one side, and the clearance on the other side was too tight to get a blade under it. I perhaps used a bit of excessive force and just sort of ripped it off the rest of the way. I mean, no damage, though. The cover itself has two important features that are completely hidden from the outside. Windows for the infrared camera and infrared laser emitter. The semi-opaque plastic disc of the blue Echo Style ring is striated on the back to facilitate the chasing light effect. There's a rubbery gasket thing which presumably prevents light leaks between the flash LEDs, the light ring, the cameras, and laser emitter. The brown printed circuit tape in the middle is best guess an RFID or NFC tag. If you know what it is, uh, please post it in the comments. Inside the unit we see the first layer, which is an aluminum support frame holding a PCB on the right. That PCB holds the LEDs and has some related components to drive them. On the left, the aluminum is covered with a matte black pad, probably to help prevent light leakage. Of course, there are holes for the cameras and laser, but I'll get to that in a moment. I give Amazon a lot of credit for using common Torx T5 screws throughout. In this video, I'm going to show a second or two of each screw being removed so that you can see exactly where and how numerous they are in case you want to take one apart, or put it back together. All of the screws have a dab of blue thread lock on them, which is a sign of quality to my mind. With the top layer removed, you can see that there's only a single connector running to it. You can see I chipped a little. I couldn't get it to slide or flip up, but that could be my mistake. I ended up just pulling it out. On this next layer, you can see the visible light camera, the infrared camera, and the infrared laser emitter. The top layer has yet more gaskets on its backside to prevent light leakage between those. Now this layer is composed of another aluminum support structure, also serving as a heat sink, with a shielded circuit board running down the middle holding the IR gear, and another PCB holding the visible light camera. This layer uses black screws having a slightly shorter length than the previous batch, but with the same diameter and threading. It took a bit of cajoling to get the assembly freed from the housing, revealing the two cables and connectors going to the board below. The back of the assembly has small pads wrapped in wire mesh, usually used to ensure a consistent ground plane, but in this case I suspect they're being used to conduct heat away from the shielded ICs below, and as retainers for the push-on connectors below. The small camera PCB comes off easily with four screws, and with the second layer out of the way we can better see the third layer and the connections between the two. Even with all the screws removed, the retainer clip and or shielding here, it wouldn't budge. It was held on with a bit of adhesive foam tape. The connector then pulled free with no problem. I should pause here to point out something that's very interesting about that second layer. That strip of shielded PCB running down the middle? That's pretty much an out-of-the-box Intel RealSense SR300 module. You can order one from Intel for about 100 bucks. The weird thing is that the SR300 comes with a visible light camera capable of 1080p at 30fps. However, that camera is omitted here. You can see a circle cut out of the shielding where it should be. Amazon clearly wanted to use their own camera, but I don't know why exactly. I suspect it may either be because they needed better low light performance, aesthetically they weren't happy with the camera orifice and flash being in the middle of the unit, or they wanted a camera oriented in portrait fashion. And again, it may just have to do with needing extra space around the camera for the various LEDs. That's all speculation of course, but it is odd on first glance that they removed a camera and added a different one. Another oddity I noticed after the second layer came out was the copper strips along the inside of the casing. I suppose you can place your own bets now. I wasn't sure at first, but it becomes really clear after that last PCB is removed. And that PCB is clearly the main one. I had correctly assumed they'd be ICs under that shielding, and it has numerous connectors of a push-on style. They release very handily when pried with a screwdriver. All of those connectors are for cables that go below this particular PCB, but the one for the camera has a metal retainer clip covering it. Again, this thing has every indication of being meticulously designed. The camera PCB is pretty unremarkable, sadly. There were only two apparent screws holding this layer down, as well as a couple of other connectors. Here at the end are two UFL style connectors, usually used for RF applications. I'm guessing either both are for Wi-Fi antennae, or one is Wi-Fi and the other is Bluetooth. Despite all that being removed, the board wouldn't budge on one end. It wasn't immediately obvious, but there are two grounding pads on either side of the green RealSense cable. With those removed, the board still wouldn't release. Banging on the table eh, didn't seem to help either. A gentle tug on the green cable was enough, but it still wouldn't come out of the housing. Getting the board at just the right angle to get it out was a pain in the ass, because it's quite a bit wider than the opening. 
but I finally got it just so and was able to pull it free. The board doesn't reveal much. All the interesting stuff is behind a whole bunch of shielding. All there is to see are the connectors and surprisingly few discrete components. The back is even worse, with the only thing of note being an adhesive pad, which as you'll see is undoubtedly to conduct heat to the back of the entire chassis. And again, I'll pause here because I wasn't going to let the mystery die. I clipped all the shielding off, and here for your viewing pleasure is the top of the board. The two ICs of note are a Samsung eMMC Flash NAND package with an 8GB capacity, and an 8-pin Winbond serial flash memory chip with a 16 megabit or 2 megabyte capacity. Obviously the Samsung chip must contain the OS and programming for the bulk of the looks functionality, and I'm not sure as to the application of the Winbond memory. If you know or have any good guesses, uh, please post in the comments. On the back of the board is where all the action is. There's a Broadcom Wi-Fi chip which is 802.11ac compatible, as well as 802.11bg a and n. This IC family comes in variants having Bluetooth and or FM radio, but the full product number here doesn't yield anything on Google. I'm assuming this does have integrated Bluetooth, as there's no other package on here that would support it. Next up is the Texas Instruments Power Management IC, for which I can't find any information. This time a Google search did locate the product number, but related pages seem to indicate that it's under NDA, meaning information theoretically won't be available, at least not to me. Now at least this chip is obvious. It's the Intel Atom X5Z8350 that's featured in Amazon's description of the look. It's nothing too exciting, but it's not a terrible CPU. It's based on 14 nanometer lithography, has four cores, a base frequency of 1.44 gigahertz, burst of both in 1.92, and a two megabyte L2 cache. It has a design power of a mere two watts, which is why, with some help, it can be sealed inside a rather airtight housing like the look. Finally, there's an Elpida, 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 whatever. It's an eight gigabyte LPDDR3 memory chip. That's right, this little bastard has eight gigabytes of RAM. I mean, that's more than cheap desktops are sold with nowadays and not a bad spec for a mid-range computer. But it's hardly surprising as visual processing, especially a full HD video and images, requires a decent amount of memory. The Intel RealSense SR300's product page shows a recommended four gigabytes of RAM at minimum, uh, presumably for their SDK. Tearing into the software on the look would be a video for another day, though. Anyway, with that board removed, we can see that there's yet another layer of stuff beneath it. And there's a whole lot of copper in there. This is about the time I figured out it's all to sink heat away from the ICs, LEDs, cameras, and etc. In fact, the adhesive, and undoubtedly thermally conductive, pad that I pulled out earlier was from the shielding on the atom to the copper foil seen here. The foil is adhered to the sides of the plastic case, and based on its lack of ventilation, I'm guessing the plastic used has a high thermal conductivity. Therefore, all of the heat generated by the components will be distributed along much of the surface of the inside of the case. Uh, it's not just because of the copper foil, but because of the final aluminum support structure at the very bottom of all this. Okay, now out comes the aluminum plate to which one section of copper is bonded. Also on there is the cable which goes from the LED board to the power module at the very back of the unit, which I'll show you in a second. Another small plate is attached right over that very power module. And here it is. Not a hell of a lot to see though. Honestly, I didn't remove that shielding because there's undoubtedly a voltage regulator under there, and kinda who cares. There were a bunch of other screws, but despite their removal, the final metal support structure would just not pull free. I did however manage to pull the speaker out, it's a two diaphragm arrangement of dubious specification. It's halfway decent though, as the look did speak at a reasonable volume with good clarity. There's a fine fabric mesh behind the through holes in the case, as well as a gasket to, I'd imagine, prevent rattling. You can see that there's some kind of black adhesive tape visible in that notch. Apparently that entire metal assembly is pretty much glued to the case. Because it's glued on three sides and due to the shape of the case, I don't think it can be removed in a non-destructive way. Well, or at least in a lazy way. That being said, I don't think it hides any real secrets. The only components remaining in there are the side button, the microphone array, which consists of four discrete mics on the top, and the antennae, which are located on the bottom. Now, here's another look at the main PCB with the shielding still attached. Notice the shielding is very thin metal, and I even took a chunk out of one of them with my pliers. Now, finally here, I'll do a loose reassembly of the main layers that make up the look, just so you can see how it all fits together. In my opinion, it's really quite ingenious that they stuck this much stuff into a tiny, unventilated, low-power rounded cylinder. 
Hell, if this thing had an HDMI port, it would probably be usable as an Amazon Fire TV box. It certainly has the hardware for it. As it is, I'm really hoping this is eminently hackable. In fact, it should be, given that all the components are completely off the shelf. Well, maybe with the exception of the TI PMIC that's under NDA. But it's got an Intel 64-bit CPU, an 8GB SSD, 8GB of RAM, a fairly generic WLAN chip, and a completely usable RealSense module, which has a downloadable SDK. This could definitely run most any flavor of Linux, Windows, or even OS X. I mean, you might need to add some flash storage, but I'll bet this has a USB header somewhere. As far as I'm concerned, the software and the overall use case for the look is pretty useless. But if Amazon opened up the hardware, maybe throwing in an HDMI and USB port, I could see this thing selling like hotcakes to makers and tinkerers the world over. I mean, put a smiley face on it, and it would even make an acceptable robot head.